Uh, the title of this panel, ladies and gentlemen, is the outcome of the U.S. presidential election, polling predictions, and the impact uh, of the Gaza war. Uh, again, my name is uh, not Yusuf Munayer, as in the program. This is Khalil Jashan again, and uh, I'm executive director of Arab Center Washington, D.C., but uh, unfortunately, I have to sub uh, for uh, Yusuf uh, uh, today because of what I just mentioned. Uh, before I introduce this morning's speakers, I would like to encourage everyone in the audience, uh, number one, to silence your cell phones, please, and uh, also to encourage you to participate in the conversations uh, that we are about to have about a very important topic, uh, the elections and the situation, of course, uh, uh, the Gaza, the emanating from the Gaza uh, war. Uh, those of you who are here in the room have uh, cards in front of you on the tables. These are for Q&A. Feel free uh, to fill those, and staff will collect them uh, as we begin the Q&A session later and bring them up to here for me to read. Feel free to address your question to a specific uh, panelist if you would like to, or to all panelists. That will be fine. Uh, for those of you uh, at home, and there are uh, hundreds of you I know uh, registered internationally, uh, feel free to zoom or, uh, use the feature on your Zoom for your Q&A uh, or uh, fax, uh, email, sorry, fax is obsolete. Email uh, your questions to uh, events at arabcenterdc.org. Again, events at arabcenterdc.org, uh, and we will be more than glad uh, to include your uh, participation in this. I would like to just quickly plug a paper that we just published this morning uh, on our website by our colleague uh, Greg Aftandilian, I think who's here in the back. Thanks, Greg, for the uh, paper, uh, focusing on foreign policy uh, impact on the November presidential election, which is uh, the same the topic of our panel today, in which uh, Greg basically is saying that, and I, I'm, I'm going to read a quote from uh, his paper summarizing the hypothesis of this paper. Feel free to look it up uh, after this uh, event today uh, if you want a little bit more, uh, let's say, discussion on, on this uh, issue. U.S. presidential elections, uh, says Gregory, uh, are usually decided on domestic issues, especially the economy. A candidate's resting his or her presidential laurels on a foreign policy triumph has often proved ephemeral as when George H.W. Bush successfully ousted Iraqi forces from Kuwait in 1991, only to lose to Bill Clinton in 1992, as Americans grappled with a recession. Although there have been times in U.S. history when foreign policy does influence an election, they have been scarce. Nonetheless, in very close races, such as this year's matchup between former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, foreign policy issues could tip the balance. In particular, voters' view, views of how the candidates would handle the Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Russia-Ukraine wars would be decisive in battleground states and thus the election as a whole. And uh, you will be hearing different perspectives uh, on this issue throughout this panel. And let me briefly introduce the speakers. Uh, and first, uh, Layla Al Abid, uh, who is uh, a well known uh, organizer and has been very visible uh, during the last uh, few months uh, in terms of her activities through We the People Action Fund and being a campaign manager uh, and campaign manager uh, in, in that uh, uh, group. Uh, Listen to Michigan uh, has been also uh, part of her activities. Uh, Osama Aburshade, Executive Director and Board Member, uh, American Muslims for Palestine, AMP, who has also, uh, and his group, been very uh, uh, involved in the election process. Uh, Dalia Mujahid, uh, scholar, former Director of Research Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, uh, who is a well-known uh, pollster and, and has been involved in tracking uh, public opinion in the Muslim community and Arab American community for years. Last but not least, uh, James Zogby. Uh, Jim is the co-founder and president, as you know, of Arab American Institute, AAI, and director of Zogby Research Services, uh, 
He has been involved, again, in uh, Arab American politics and polling uh, Arab American votes since Adam and Eve. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to trick him, but, uh, yeah. but he resisted. All right. Uh, fun telling of my story. understanding is, uh, <laughs> according to the arrangement uh, that Yusuf worked out with you guys, uh, Leila, you're supposed to go first, right? Go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Leila Labid. I am a first generation Palestinian American. Um, I live in Dearborn, Michigan and have organized locally within the Arab American and Muslim American community. I was the campaign manager for Listen to Michigan, um, Vote Uncommitted, which was the catalyst for the national movement. Um, from there, I co-directed and co-founded the Uncommitted National Movement that earned, thank you, okay. that earned almost 800,000 protest votes across the country and 30 delegates um, to the Democratic National Convention. And the last time there was delegates who went to the convention not committed to a candidate was in 1964 under the leadership of Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom Party. And we were very proud to represent our pro-Palestine anti-war movement at the convention where we left with over 320 Harris delegates who are committed to seeing a arms embargo. And interested in mobilizing within their state parties to continue growing our movement. Um, these 30 delegates were from seven states um, across the country, including the key swing state of Michigan. And uh, we will continue growing this movement. Um, and I'm very uh, excited to share, you know, exactly what's happening on the ground in Michigan right now. Um, as Michigan is a key battleground state um, that you need in your pathway um, to the White House. So I'm excited to share that information. Thank you. Osama, would you please? Thank you, Khalil. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Osama Abu Shed. I'm the executive director of the of American Muslims for Palestine and its affiliate C4 organization, 51 c 4 organization, Americans for Justice in Palestine. We co-founded the American Muslim Task Force for 2024 elections with other major Muslim C4 organizations. Uh, our aim is to mobilize our community to continue to be engaged. There is uh, a lot of frustration within the Palestinian Arab and Muslim community with the Biden administration and with Democrats at large. And for good reasons. Um, our government has been enabling a genocide in the Gaza Strip and now is enabling Israel in another genocide in Lebanon. On the other hand, we understand that Donald Trump is not a better alternative. We understand that he poses a threat to our community, to other minorities. In fact, he poses a threat to the United States at large. Uh, we all are following now his uh, racist attacks on the Haitian community. Uh, he is threatening that he will reinstate the Muslim ban he is also pledging that if he, if he's elected, uh, that he will go after Palestinian Arab and Muslim organizations and actually Jewish organizations who support the Palestinian plight and the Palestinian cause. And we see now efforts in the House of Representatives to go after our organizations, as I said, including Jewish organizations, uh, and inciting the IRS law enforcement to investigate us 
just because we are practicing our first amendment. So we understand that we're facing a dilemma here when it comes to Donald Trump, but also we're facing another moral dilemma when it comes to Kamala Harris, who refused to distinguish herself in a substantive way from Biden when it comes to the genocide in Gaza. Other than rhetoric, we didn't see any concrete steps from her or concrete pledges. So the Muslim community, the Arab community, the Palestinian community are grappling with, with these two conflicting dilemmas, the moral and the political. Thus, we have opted not to endorse Kamala Harris but also to ask our community to be engaged and definitely not to vote for Donald Trump, although there is a small percentage that will end up voting for him. And on the same token, we decided not to criticize those who will vouch for Kamala Harris out of fear of Donald Trump being elected again. One last point, Donald Trump does not pose a threat only to us. He also poses a threat to America, a man who is threatening violence if he is not if he does not win the elections. So we shouldn't be in a position as Americans to choose between bad and worse. In fact, there should be a better option for all Americans to choose. Thank you. Thank you, Osama. Uh, Dalia, could you uh, take us, let's say, to the uh, national picture uh, at large uh, by fitting what's the struggle that Osama just described in the Muslim and, and Arab American communities are they alone, uh, or is, is there a kind of a national sentiment that they fit in uh, with regards to their concerns? Thank you so much, and uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, am a scholar at ISPU and former director of research there, where we have been conducting national polls of Muslim Americans as well as Americans of other faiths and backgrounds for the past eight years. What I'd like to share with you is just some top line results from a poll that we just conducted very recently, but unfortunately, when Biden was still the candidate. Uh, I still think the data is quite relevant um, to our discussion today. So this survey was in three swing states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, among Muslim voters, as well as the general public. So we, all, we had a control group for these three polls, and this was a representative sample of voters across these three states. And what we found in, you know, shortly before um, Biden dropped out of the race was that his support among Muslim voters went from 65% in 2020, in fact, they I would argue and, and can prove to you with numbers that Muslim voters gave him these three states. It was a very close election in these three swing states. So among Muslims were among the most supportive of uh, Biden. 65% said they voted for him in 2020. And that number in 2024, before he dropped out, went down to 12%. He has not suffered this kind of a loss in any other community or even close. So where did all these voters go? Are they all now Trump supporters? The answer is absolutely not. Um, whereas 18% in 2020 voted for Trump, that number inched up to 22%, almost within the margin of error, right? So, so we went from 18 to 22% supporting Trump and the the difference has gone to uh, basically three um, categories. One is third party. They plan on voting for a third party. We, we didn't go further in asking exactly who, but a third party of some sort, around 30% are going to, said that they would vote for a third party, which is the highest of any community by a lot, by far. 17% uh, are undecided, and 13% say they don't plan to vote at all. And that is slightly higher than um, 2020, where it was 9%. So it's not that everyone's opting out. That has gone up a bit. So the danger of not being involved is quite relevant. We should, we should deal with that. Um, but 13% of Muslims saying they're not going to vote is pretty standard overall. Since 2016, 
we've had about 13% of Muslims just opt out. They don't want to vote. It's not that they can't vote. These are all eligible voters. They just don't feel like they, it, the system doesn't work for them. The, the reasons they give for not voting is mostly no, no candidate represents my interests. So, and then the, this is the category that uh, I also wanted to make sure we touched on. 17% at that time said that they were undecided. Undecided who they were gonna vote for and perhaps undecided even if they were going to vote. Now what explains this enormous drop? Now we all intuitively think it's Gaza, but is it really? Do the numbers bear that out? And the, and the answer is the numbers 100% bear that out. The number one policy issue that respondents gave us in an open-ended question, they could have chosen anything uh, when asked, how are you going to judge a candidate in this election, was the handling of the war in Gaza. Now, I want to just emphasize that this question we've been asking for years, what, what are the policy issues that you're voting based on? And what Muslims normally look like is your standard Democrat. They don't, they don't look different from essentially what Democrats care about. They, they talk about health care, they talk about education, they talk about the economy. And it's about 20% saying, you know, the economy is my number one thing, 18% saying it's health care. They don't, they are indistinguishable from a standard Democrat. This year, they couldn't have been more different. You had, in the first time I've ever seen it, one issue, one policy, when the majority of the respondents' vote, or the majority of the respondents' choice, we have 67% all agreeing and choosing the war in Gaza as a top three issue on which they will vote, with the second most frequent, so 67, the second most frequent, 22%. So a distant second. And that's not what the Democratic Party looks like at all right now, where it's only about 4% in the general public that say it's Gaza. Among Democrats, it's also in the single digits, Democrats in the general public. So you have Muslims galvanized around this issue. And what was really interesting is it was the top policy issue, now to varying degrees, but still nothing was more important. The top policy issue, whether they said they were gonna vote for Biden, Trump, or were undecided, or third party. But the highest uh, support for this being a policy issue were, was among people who had essentially abandoned Biden, who, had, um, who say that they are going to vote third party or are yet undecided. We called them swing voters in the report. And so all, everything I've just said is available online on our website, ispu.org. I will just uh, point out one more thing. When you look at the general public who wanted to vote for Biden before he dropped out and, and were planning on voting for Trump, they look very different in one distinct way. The Biden voters did not have a single galvanizing issue, meaning they looked like they looked, they've always looked, which is 18% say it's this, 20% say it's that, nothing is like 67%. So they're kind of, all over the place in terms of what they care about. So some of their top issues, reproductive rights, nothing surprising, right? The preservation of democracy. But Trump voters have one galvanizing issue, one thing that they are all just rallying around, which is what we, um, I don't know, it's, it's interesting, people don't always guess it, it's security at the border. More than 65% of Trump voters say that that is a top three issue for them. So their, their Gaza is security at the border. But Muslim voters are distinct from both Democrats and Republicans on what they care about this election. So while foreign policy doesn't usually decide elections, it is deciding the Muslim vote this time, where it never had before. And Muslims matter in these three swing states. Thank you uh, so much, Dalia. I appreciate it. Uh, Jim? Thanks, Khalil. Um, and thanks to all of you. I, um, uh, we've done more recent polling 
we actually have a poll that will be coming out next week of Arab American voters, um, and we had a poll just about a month ago of U.S. voters uh, across uh, across the, the country. Um, let, me, let me make a couple a couple points. Uh, the first is that Gaza does in fact loom large. Um, in in two ways, it impacts the Arab American vote. And we obviously have a, a difference here. Uh, uh, Arab Americans, a majority of Arab Americans are not Muslim, and the majority of Muslims are not Arab. And so th there are two distinct communities in many ways. Mm -hmm. But you'll see as I go down through some of the, the data um, that uh, where, the, where the overlaps are. Uh, if the other two major component groups of Muslims are African American, uh, African immigrant, and Asian immigrant. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in the polling we do of U.S. numbers, we find that the constituencies most impacted by Gaza are young people and non-white voters, uh, black, Asian, and Latino. Uh, in fact, if you pull their numbers out of the Democratic numbers, you get a very different that They are driving the Democratic Party on this, uh, on, on many issues, but in particular on this. For example, if you ask uh, about uh, how they feel about what Israel's doing, uh, two-thirds of young people and non-white voters are opposed, whereas other voters are in a very different, uh, a very different camp on that. So when you look at Democrats overall, having a majority of them opposed to Israel, that majority is being driven by young voters and, um, and non-white voters. Um, among Arab Americans, the issue looms very large, uh, in, and it, it shows up in many ways, a number of the ways that, uh, that Dalia just described. But given the fact that we've been polling now for 30 years with Arab Americans, and we've always seen a Democratic edge, but from the second Bush term through the Biden election, they were two to one Democrat, and that is no longer the case. In, in simply a four-year period, there was a collapse. Now, why would there be that quick a collapse? Partly it's Gaza, partly it's Gaza, but I think it's also that what you have is, in America, a very weak party ID system right now. It's not like in, in, in UK, where you're a member of the Tory party or a member of the Labor Party. Being a member of the Democratic or Republican Party means you're on a mailing list, a phone call list, an email list, you get begging, we need your money before midnight, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's no organizational structure, so party ID is weak. That translates in an interesting way so that older voters, for example, are Democrat or Republican. They're not going anywhere. Uh, when we look at the polling in Pennsylvania, for example, Arab Americans in Pennsylvania, Democrats win. When you look at the polling in Michigan, Democrats are in trouble because it's a more immigrant population in, in, in Michigan. In Pennsylvania, it's a more settled uh, population of folks who've been there for generations, and they have a stronger identification with the Democrats. Come hell or high water, they're voting Democrat. They're union people, et cetera. Um, so there's a, a, a drop in the Democrat support base among, in particular, the more recent immigrants, but also among young people who are a very large component of the Arab American community. Uh, there's also a drop, as Dahlia noted, in enthusiasm. Uh, among among voters. When we polled Arab Americans in June or July, we found almost half were saying, and that was when Biden was still in, that almost a half were saying um, they either weren't going to vote or they were going to vote for one or another of the third party candidates. Now, Harris's entry into the race has changed that for Democrats generally, but also for, for Arab Americans, so that her numbers have gone up from where Biden's were. Uh, people are more solidly around her than they were around Biden. Biden's numbers had fallen through the floor, collapsed. Uh, but uh, what you also get is a, um, is a sense of um, malaise about uh, how enthusiastic are they about um, uh, voting? Not, not as enthusiastic. So the support for her went up, but the interest in voting went down. And I think that's something that Democrats have to think about. I remember when you all were doing the uncommitted in Michigan, they were saying, well, they only got 100,000 votes. I say, yeah, but you got so little too. And actually, they had to work really hard to get those 100. It's hard. It's easy 
to get a loyal Democrat to turn out for the candidate. It's hard to get somebody to vote uncommitted. I mean, last time uncommitted did a rally. You know what I mean? It's like it's not like a personal attachment. It's a principled cause. So your 800,000 votes translated to many more people because you had to work to get them. When people were telling me during the, the campaign, well, yeah, I know they're doing this now, but when November, when it's a binary choice, they'll choose. I said, no, no, no. The binary choice will be, do I vote or not vote at all? That's the binary choice. And that's the thing I think that has to be considered here. Um, so enthusiasm is an issue. Um, the just one thing, because there have been some polls out there showing, you know, Kamala Harris or, or Jill Stein getting some bizarre number of polls. That's just nonsense. I mean, that's not, most, I dare say most Arab Americans, most Americans have no idea who the hell she is or, or who the hell Cornell West is. I like Cornell, but I don't know what he's running for. I mean, the reality is that when you look at the demographics of where the communities are on this, a, a very small number are going to vote for third party candidates. The big issue is not they vote third party, the big issue is that they don't vote at all. And or they do as the, the mayor of Hamtramck just did, they do a screw you to Democrats. I'm really mad and I'm going to do this. And, and look, the Hamtramck thing is interesting because what we have to consider is that, yeah, Gaza looms large. It does loom very large. For example, if you look at the um, uh, the numbers that we got are very similar to yours. Um, a huge number of people saying Gaza was the important issue for them in, in this election. And how they're voting, just as Nadia noted, splits. <laughs> Gaza will loom large and so they'll vote Trump because they're telling Democrats, get the hell with you. It'll loom large for Democrats because they'll say, yeah, it's like I, maybe she's going to be better. I hope she's going to be better or it will loom large for those who aren't going to vote at all because they'll say, I don't see a reason to, to do this right now. So it, 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 is, um, um, it is a big issue, um, but it muddies up the water in a way that there is not, um, uh, it's a soft vote. For example, we ask voters, uh, it's a virtual tie between the two, Trump and, and Harris and the numbers we get, but when we ask voters, if Harris were to demand an immediate ceasefire, and if Israel didn't do it, suspend diplomatic support and weapons, would it make you more or less likely to vote for her? Her numbers shot up, completely shot up. Uh, went over 60%, went over better than Biden had done against Trump the last time. Now, um, and it came from, from literally everywhere. It took a third of Trump voters, it literally wiped out the third party candidates and those who were unenthusiastic about voting all of a sudden got enthusiastic. So it's a soft rejection. It's not a hard rejection. Keep going, and it might get hard, but right now it's still, it's still soft. So I think that we're still in a very fluid place in this contest. Um, Gaza is a, a deciding factor. And I, as I noted in the beginning, as Dottie did too, it's not just among Arab Americans. It's young Young voters, black voters in particular, uh, Latino, Asian voters, um, it is impacting 10, 15% of them, in some cases 20, um, among young blacks. And I, these are voters you can't leave on the table. <laughs> you know, you gotta do something with them because Democrats need to keep their coalition together to win. Um, Trump doesn't have a lock on it. He can play the values card with the, uh, with the mayor of uh, Hamtramck. The, the LGBTQ opposition thing, you know, that, that might, might resonate for some. But I, I think that, we're, like I said, we're, we've got a month or so to go, and it's a very fluid election. And a tilt or a nod um, can make a difference. We just have to see how this plays out. But right now, Gaza is a deciding factor. Lebanon soon may join it as, unfortunately, a deciding factor, in particular in Michigan. You don't, yeah. you don't say anything about Lebanon, and I tell you just, you know, you can, you can kiss Michigan goodbye right now because it is, it is, I mean, after all, Dearborn is literally two towns from South Lebanon that emptied out after Israel's invasion. They feel very strongly about this. Mm -hmm. And it will take away any sense of doubt about, now what did they do? Do they stay home? Do they vote for Trump? Um, I don't know, but I do know that Democrats have to worry about you know, how we respond uh, and respond more effectively uh, to these twin crises right now that we're facing. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that.
Thank you. Thank you to all four of you. Uh, uh, let me uh, go back. Uh, first of all, let me encourage everybody again, the Q&A cards in front of you at the table. Feel free to join us uh, in this discussion. Uh, once you have a question uh, or a remark, uh, raise your hand with the card. Staff will pick it up and bring it, bring it uh, over here for me uh, to read. Let me begin first uh, a question to uh, Layla. Uh, the standing situation right now in, in Michigan that you referred to, is that going from your perspective and based on your constituency, is that going to last through uh, e election day, November uh, 5th, and is it going to impact so the election? What's happening in Michigan just, Michigan, just to give some background and to kind of add on to what uh, both of you have said and, and as far as the data, there are 250,000 Muslims in Michigan. And in 2020, Biden won Michigan by 150,000 votes. What we demonstrated in Michigan with over 101,000 uncommitted votes was that Biden was a, a political liability to the Democratic Party when we were saying, you don't have the support you need in November to win a state like Michigan. And just to point out the, what that data in Michigan, those 101,000 votes, clearly shows that this is not just contained within the Arab American or Muslim American community. Uncommitted brought out young voters. It brought out black voters, Latino voters, it was a multi-generational, multi-racial campaign. And we were able to earn over 10% of uncommitted votes in 73 counties out of 83 counties in Michigan. And on, election, on the day of the election, on the primary, by the way, we only had 21 days to do this campaign. We launched Listen to Michigan on February 6th. And our primary was February 27th. And in those 21 days, with incredible campaigning, with over 1.5 million voter contact calls and text messages, we were able to earn that many voters. But some of those counties that were first reported wasn't Wayne County, where you have Dearborn, where you have the largest concentration of Arab Americans, and you have a large black community, an immigrant community. The first numbers that we were getting that were already surpassing our uh, margin of victory of 10,000 votes based on Trump's victory over Hillary in, in 2016 was outside of Wayne County, which include Oakland County, Washtenaw County and Macomb County. And anybody who knows anything about the demographic of those counties, they are mostly majority non-Arab, non-Muslim. So to, to already surpass our, uh, our margin of victory just in those counties was honestly incredible. Um, and then we earned over 15% of the overall votes in Congressional District 6, which is in Washtenaw County, De uh, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell's district, which is largely, ha has U of M Ann Arbor. It's a, it's a college town. And most of those votes concentrated among students. And we were able to actually bring out 43% of first time voters among students. Um, in the, the second uh, congressional district where we won a delegate was Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib's uh, district, where we won over 15% of the vote. The reason why these are so important to look at is because it shows that the, at that time, during February, the majority of the Democratic base in Michigan was not was not supportive of, of uh, President Biden because of the disastrous Gaza policy. But also, I think 
another piece that we need to look at is that I think it's very true. I think that most voters in Michigan among the Arab American and Muslim American community and young people are not going to go out and vote. Voter apathy is at an all-time high. Even, even when Palestine was on the ballot in Dearborn, Michigan, the epicenter of Arab America, it only earned 6,500 votes when Palestine was on the ballot to vote uncommitted. We only earned 6,500 votes in Michigan, in Dearborn, where there are 80,000 registered voters. When you look at the, the primary in August in Michigan, and particularly in Dearborn, and Hamtramck, and other places, where there's a high concentration of Arab Americans and Muslim Americans, voters just did not go out and vote. And I think that is the reality that we are going to see, particularly in Michigan, is that voters are not excited about either candidate. And I think exactly what you said, uh, James, about third party, I think when you look at the activist class, yes, you see an excitement for voting third party. But I am talking about, I am on the ground as an organizer, talking to my community members, going door to door. The majority of our communities are not going to go out and vote in November. And that's just, that's just very, the reality of it. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're going to be in trouble. Uh, appreciate yeah. it. There is a question for you, uh, Osama. Uh, many overtures have been made by both camps uh, as of late uh, to the Muslim American community or individuals within it and to the Arab American community or individuals within it by both campaigns. Uh, are they making any inroads? Are they connecting with, <laughs> with anybody from your perspective? It's a very difficult question to mm. answer because our community is not monolithic. So if we talk now, I'm, I'm talking now in reference to the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. If we talk about the African-American, they are overwhelmingly uh, supportive of Kamala Harris. If we talk about the immigrant community, I think the majority, and I would disagree with um, Jim here, the majority want to vote for Jill Stein. So she might not be a viable option or that will known to the American public, but she is well known to the immigrant Muslim community. And um, if we will reference CARES um, poll just last month, I think it, sh it shows clearly that a majority, mainly in swing states, in particular in Michigan, are going to vote for her. So there were these uh, communications uh, mainly the Harris, camp, Harris and, and Jill Stein's campaigns both reached out. I know that the uh, Trump campaign reached out to some uh, Arabs in, in Michigan, uh, but they didn't reach out to us. But I know that Kamala Harris uh, or her, her campaign did reach out, but we didn't get anything from them. Uh, our focus was Gaza. And we cannot go against the sentiment uh, within our community. Now, what needs to be understood is that these elections might not be decided by the Arab or Muslim votes. If the margins are so wide between Kamala Harris and, and Trump, Kamala Harris is not Biden. She infused more energy, more enthusiasm within, Democrat, within, the, within the Democratic base. And she has more pathways to win the presidency as opposed to Biden. This is given. Now, we have two um, previous instances where the a campaign or a, a major candidate undermined the possibility of losing. That was in 2000 with Al Gore and George Bush in Florida an election that was decided by a few hundred votes. Muslims usually don't tend to vote for Republicans, but in that particular elections, they voted for, overwhelmingly, voted for George Bush 
in Michigan, in, in Florida. He won the presidency. There were consequences for the Muslim community after 9-11. So I'm not going to deny this fact. And I'm speaking as someone who knows what it means to be a member of a community that is under siege. In 2016, Hillary Clinton also dismissed the viability of the Trump campaign. She ended up losing in swing states. And as um, Layla just explained, she lost by 11,000 votes in Michigan because there wasn't that much excitement within the Democratic base. And definitely the Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim Americans were not very excited about her. She lost in Pennsylvania as well. And let us remember that she almost lost in Minnesota. So compare this to 2020, where there was more enthusiasm within Democrats because the other candidate was Donald Trump. Biden was basing his whole campaign about the threat that Trump poses to America and to minorities. Now Biden is not the candidate, and this didn't work for him. And Kamala Harris cannot just base her, um, her uh, appeal to voters uh, uh, based on or because Donald Trump is the opposite uh, candidate. So our, our community now, I, I would say yes, maybe many of them won't vote because they're disappointed, they're frustrated, they think that nothing can change this structure that we're, the political structure that we're dealing with. But this will mean bad news if the elections is so close in the swing states, in Wisconsin as well in Pennsylvania, in uh, Georgia. Georgia, Donald Trump won by, uh, lost by 11,000 votes, 11 plus. And we have hundreds of thousands of Muslims, of Arabs who are in Georgia. So I won't just dismiss the Muslim, the Arab, and the Palestinian vote in the coming elections because the Democrats will be making a huge mistake. And no one is expecting that Kamala Harris can make a substantial shift in policy now. What they're looking for, we know there is one president at a time. We know that she's the VP. She's not only the Democratic candidate. But at least, at least, they have to hear something different from her in terms of substance. And this is something that we haven't seen so far. In fact, what we have seen is, the, uh, is denying a Palestinian American to speak during the DNC. What we have seen is her continuous insist, insist, uh, ins, uh, insistent that she will continue to support Israel while paying lip service to the suffering of the Palestinian people. This is not going to resonate and excite a community that feels so hurting by their own nation. Arab and Muslim Americans are American citizens. They shouldn't be treated as something separate. But there is this tendency to try to disenfranchise the Arab and Muslim Americans. So at the end of the day, there are some allies who are um, um, cautioning us that if Kamala Harris ends up losing, it will be on us. I don't think it's on us. I mean, imagine that Kamala Harris goes against the demands of the reproductive rights or against the environmentalists within, within the democratic base, she would be blamed for it. Hillary Clinton was blamed for not winning over the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in 2016. So as Palestinians, as Arab, and as Muslims, we understand the consequences of a second pre uh, Trump presidency, but also we have a moral compass where we cannot vote for someone who, ha who, is, who continues to enable the genocide that is taking place in Gaza and continues to embolden Israel to wage another war in Lebanon. That's where we are today. And uh, we have just to deal with whatever consequences uh, we will be faced of. It's not that we want Trump, but it's not a choice that we make. It's a choice that the candidates themselves make, mainly Kamala Harris in this case. Thank you, uh, Osama. Jim, uh, although you uh, kind of answered this question, but during Nuruddin Ghanim of TRT, 
uh, is basically asking, uh, what if the war uh, spills over to Lebanon or expands uh, in Lebanon? What would be the effect on the elections, which you quickly referred to earlier, if you don't mind uh, expanding a bit on that? And who's better for Gaza, Trump or Harris? And who's better for Israel? Maybe that last question should be addressed to, to APAC, not to us, but... Uh, uh, I would say the first part is legit. We, we would like to tackle that, if you don't mind, Jim. Yeah, l listen, let me, uh, let me just say a couple things. First is um, our polling is on our website, aaiusa.org, aaiusa.org. And our most recent poll will be out next Wednesday. And if you listen to the Coffee and Column Zoom chat I do every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, my brother John will be on with me and we'll be, we'll be talking about the poll. Um, your question. Um, I, I've been just trying to talk about the numbers, but I'm gonna sort of turn myself around and, and, and talk about politics if I can. Um, um, and this is gonna get me in trouble with some folks. And when you're 78, you're gonna be 79 next month, you don't give a shit anymore. It's like, it, it, I mean, I've, I've, taken the, I've taken the blows from all sides, and I'll, I'll take some here. Um, Go on. I was giving you the numbers of where people are. I was telling you how people feel. I was telling you what the candidates needed to do. But um, I don't think in this election we have a choice. I remember Julian Bond in 1968 after... Everybody got beat up for opposing the war in Vietnam in the convention after Julian Bond led the mixed delegate, uh, uh, the, the sort of mixed race delegation from Georgia and the party regulars were opposed to it, but he won that fight and then he ran for vice, they put him up for vice president even though he was too young and he got, uh, delegates got beaten up on the floor for, for supporting Julian Bond. And the final night of the convention Humphrey and Muskie came out, and uh, the balloons dropped, and Julian Bond comes from around the back, and he holds the Humphrey and Muskie hands up. And I was devastated as a kid. You know, I was 22 years old, and I was like, what the hell's he doing? We fought for him, and here's he turn, turned his back on us. And I got to know Julian uh, later, and about four years later, I was with him, driving him uh, someplace, and I said, I have to ask you, you devastated us when you did that. You just devastated us. You turned your back on the war and everything. He said, let me tell you, there's two kinds of people. There's people who sit high up on their pinnacle and say, I have principles and I'm not getting involved in that muck because the choices aren't, aren't good ones. He said, and then there are people who say, look at the muck and say, I got to get down in there because people need help. I got to do what I can do to try to make it at least a little bit better. He said, at that point, the election was no longer Julian Bond versus Hubert Humphrey but it was Hubert Humphrey versus Richard Nixon. There was only one choice to make. I made it. You ask the question, um, who's gonna be better? I don't know who's gonna be better, but I know what will be the better relationship that we'll have, the better coalition that we'll be able to build if there's a Democrat in the White House. If you think about those four Trump years, we couldn't do a damn thing. <laughs> there was nothing you could do. People were demobilized. People were traumatized, and you didn't know when you woke up in the morning what the next shock thing he was going to do was going to be. But we know in a democratic coalition like we have right now, even though they're doing all the wrong stuff, we have allies. We have allies in the black community, we have allies in the progressive Jewish community, we have allies in the black and Latino communities, we have allies in labor, we have allies all over the place. They're all Democrats. And that democratic coalition is the place, it's our home where we've, I'm doing politics now, I'm not doing my polling. It's the home where we've learned we have a receptive audience on everything from immigration to civil liberties. I mean, remember the hearing just the other day with Maya Berry and the Republicans and Democrats? I mean, it's like, it's two different countries. She was there to talk about hate crimes. They were there to hate on her over Palestine. Don't tell me there's no difference. There is a difference between the two parties. There's a difference in the two coalitions. I mean, yeah, if you want to stop LBGTQ books in the schools, 
yeah, join with Moms for Liberty and, and, uh, and, and do that. But if you want to fight for justice and peace in the world, there's only one coalition that is working for you. It's a tough one. And I keep pushing the Harris people, I keep pushing the, I keep pushing the party, I keep telling them, you are screwing yourself. And like you said, Osama, it's not on us, it's on them. They have to make the right choice. They have to do the right stuff. Don't blame me if you lose. But I am telling you, as I say to them, that you've got to make the right choice, but at the same time I'm telling the community we've got to make the right choice too. Because we can't let our allies down. I don't want to see what happens to the next generation of, of young kids if we have a takeover by Republicans of the hate Republican. Look, my brother's right. He said, we need a third party. We need a Republican party. There is not a Republican party anymore. What there is is a Trump cult running against Democrats. And Democrats are not up to the task right now. But that's one thing we can do, <laughs> is we can help strengthen the progressive voices, the organized progressive community within the Democratic Party. That's, that's our home right now. And so I'll stop there. I hope I answered that question. You did, definitely. Thank you. Uh, there are several. Uh, oh, just one, one thing. One thing. I'm sorry. Joe Biden came to Washington. Uh, first time I testified in front of him was 1976. Uh, I testified against the Sinai disengagement plan because they were ignoring the secret deal that Kissinger had made to tell Israel, if you do this, we will not talk to the PLO or recognize self-determination. So I went to testify against it. Joe Biden was on the committee. He was ideological and locked in place in this neoconservative mindset then. He's a neoconservative in the Democratic Party, is what he is. Kamala Harris is a different generation. She is a woman of color, and it means something to her. So I'm willing to assume from conversations that we've had and from stuff she said, it's not just lip service. Um, I, I, she's got to fight within her circle. We have to help that fight by strengthening the progressive voices in the Democratic Party to make a difference, and that's where I am. I uh, totally agree with Jim on, on this last one. As a repentant uh, lobbyist uh, <laughs> on, on, on behalf of Arab Americans for many years, I you. and uh, having debated Biden at one point in a close session regarding a Palestinian issue, uh, I, I came out uh, with the same feeling, Jim. Uh, he, he was just totally adamant, and there's no way you could change his mind on any uh, of these uh, issues. And again, uh, after eight meetings with uh, his advisors at the White House since this war started, I came out with the impression, as Jim has and other colleagues, uh, you know, when, when the top advisor tells you the old man is determined to do, quote, this, this, and this. Uh, it, it, it's very difficult to give and take. So he, he's not your typical Democrat, let me put it this way. There were several questions, by the way, from the audience uh, with regards to the issue of Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. Uh, it's not that they're trying to split the group, but they're confused in terms of, particularly for you two as, as pollsters, in terms of public opinion over the years, have you detected other than what Jim mentioned earlier, in general terms, are the opinions between the two communities or internally with other sub-communities, are they that distinct? Are there really differences uh, that you can detect in numbers? So go ahead, uh, Dalia, and Jim, if you'd like to comment on that too. Yeah, sure, I'll start. So Arab Americans make up 14% of Muslim Americans. And, uh, in our poll, we looked at the groups, you know, by the major uh, ethnic and racial groups. So it's Arab, white, which was actually different from Arab, uh, black, and Asian were the four major groups. And Arab Americans and Asian Americans were the strongest in those four lineup in terms of their prioritization of, of Gaza, not surprising. But I just want to emphasize this, all four groups including black Americans who are Muslim, did choose Gaza more often than any other policy issue. So it was the vast majority of Arab Americans 
and not the majority of black Americans, but still the number one choice. So I do want to emphasize, I, or I just want to clarify that regardless of racial background, if, uh, if you're a Muslim in these three states, Gaza is still more often chosen as a top issue than any other issue. But yes, there are variations across racial backgrounds. Uh, now, are Muslim Americans as a whole distinctly different from Arab Americans? I actually think um, the answer is no. And the reason I say that is because Arab Americans, although they are more, uh, more focused on Gaza, other Muslims, or I'm sorry, Arab Muslim Americans um, are more focused on Gaza. Other Muslim Americans are not far behind, especially Asians and even whites. Uh, and all four rac major racial groups within the Muslim American community do choose Gaza as their number one policy issue. Jim, would you like to? Yeah, yeah look, the, um, as I noted in the, in the polling we've done on Gaza, if you're just talking about Gaza, about Israel, Palestine, uh, there is a convergence, and the convergence is largely due to the fact that we have, among people of color, right, uh, a, 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 and a convergence of views with the with where Arab Americans are. Uh, black, Latino, Asian uh, feel strongly about this. There's a especially the young community that have a global mindset uh, as opposed to a more parochial mindset. I think that's 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 important to to consider. The one thing I'd say about the distinction is the respect for identity that is important. Um, and this administration has failed miserably on that front. Um, they, they have um, outreach. This is the first time we've had a White House, uh, a Democratic White House in particular, that did not do Arab American outreach. They did Muslim outreach. Everything was subordinated. And when we say, but we want Arab American, they'd say, well, we could have a Christian meeting and invite some of the Christian groups and invite you. And I'm like, holy shit, that's what we, we, we formed an Arab American community precisely to get away from sectarian identity. Because remember, when we were in our formative period as or building organizations, we were going through civil war in Lebanon, right? And it was like that, the, the wall divisions between Christian and Muslim, we wanted to erase that. Lebanese ambassador came to my office, said, how do you organize your staff? I said, organizing units here and the research units there. And the, he said, no, 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 how do you organize your staff? I said, by function? He said, no, 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 the guy out front, Rami, he's a Muslim, Shia, right, from South Lebanon. I said, I have no idea, it's not on the job application, we never asked them. We supported candidates regardless of religion because they were of Arab descent and we wanted to empower a community and turn Arab, which had been, if you recall, 70s, whatever, it was like a slur. Like Palestinian is a slur now, it was a slur back then. The Arabs are giving money to this guy or whatever. And we wanted to turn it into a, an asset instead of a liability. And we did. And we succeeded in the Clinton years and we did well in the Obama years and then all of a sudden we have an administration that's like, Arabs don't exist, you're Christian and you're Muslim. And they divided us, they tried to divide us on religion. Is there a place for Muslim? Of course there is. There is a distinct Muslim community that identifies itself on faith and on several other principles that bring them together as a community. But there's an Arab American community too. And it's this distinct one. And man, you can walk and chew gum at the same time if you run the White House. And they have not figured out how to do it. And one of the things I'm pleased with about Harris is that they hired a Muslim outreach person, then they hired an Arab American outreach person. And they're treating, and they actually go together to things and they know how to do that but they also have respected the integrity of this community and the integrity of that community. And I think it's important that we do that and we continue that. Thank you. Uh, can, can I just add that yeah, please. they're also dividing the Muslim community. There are the good Muslims and the bad Muslims. So if you're critical of the Biden administration, you don't get invited. And this is official. There is a criteria that they go by. Uh -huh. When they invite people into the White House or to the State Department. So Osama is a troublemaker, so you don't invite him. X is good, and you can swallow whatever comes from him or her. So and they've I done think- that with, They've done that with Arab Americans. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, shame on us that we have allowed this to happen. So we understand that they wanna do this. Now, uh, whether to divide the community from within or to divide us based on uh, sectarian lines, but also they're doing it based on political 
opinions and where do we stand in relation to the issues as well. Yeah, and what Osama is referring to is not history, by the way. We've faced this, both of these questions that Jim referred to and, and Osama just referred to in the recent meetings with regards to the war in Gaza by Biden at high-ranking officials. Yeah. I wanted to just add one thing. There was a question, I think, at some point, wh who, which candidate is better for Israel? And I think we, there was sort of some debate. I did... Uh, uh, I think that someone said maybe that's a question for AIPAC. It was actually a question posed to the Israeli public, uh, which candidate would be better for Israel. And in that survey, the vast majority of Israelis said Trump. So if that matters mm -hmm. to anybody, just wanted to throw that <laughs> fact out there. All right, Lena addresses this question to Layla, uh, if you don't mind. How would you address the concerns that the uncommitted vote May, although Jim has kind of answered that, but whether you agree or not, that the uncommitted vote may translate into votes for Trump or, or may cause him uh, to win instead. Yeah, very similar to what um, uh, James said. It, you know, voters who voted uncommitted or voters who don't vote in November or vote third party or decide to skip the top of the ticket shouldn't be blamed if Trump enters the White House. When has it ever been that we blame voters and not the candidate? It is the job of the candidate to earn voters. And you know, the we've always said that the uncommitted campaign, the uncommitted vote was giving a gift to the Democratic Party to tell them early on you do not have the support of your Democratic base in order to defeat Trump in November. Mm -hmm. That if you are serious about fighting fascism and authoritarianism <clears throat> on the ballot in November, that you also need to fight, need to fight fascism and authoritarianism abroad. Right now, Netanyahu and his government in Israel represent the most far-right-wing government Israel has ever had. And so, even with Harris moving to the top of the ticket, I think, I think for a lot of us, especially leaders within the uncommitted national movement, it provided a, a window. You know, we were, after we earned almost 800,000 votes, 30 delegates to the DNC, we were signaling to Biden and his campaign and his administration to meet with us, to talk about policy change, to talk about how do we bring a Democratic win in November. And honestly, nobody from the administration, the Biden administration, reached out to us. So when the shift came with Kamala at the top of the ticket, it did provide an open window. You know, we heard her be more sympathetic to the plight of Palestinians. Um, but we know that's not enough. And, and I think also one thing I want to point out is that it is always Democrats during you know, a mass shooting or a school shooting or tragic gun violence who are the first to say thoughts and prayers are not enough. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been saying to Vice President Harris and her campaign is, yes, thank you for your sympathy, thank you for your empathy, but that's not enough. We don't have a messaging problem, we have a funding bombs problem. And really, I think, once again, if, if voters are not excited to vote for Vice President Kamala Harris, even though the uncommitted movement has tried over and over again to offer something to her, to her campaign. Even a request for a Palestinian American or someone to provide the human impact testimony to our US policy decisions in, in Gaza at the, on the main stage of the DNC was rejected. It was a complete, in my opinion, a mistake of the Democratic Party and the Harris campaign. Because even, you know, if, if Folks had read Rua Rahman, the Palestinian American um, elected from Georgia. She was willing to offer Vice President Harris her endorsement from that main stage as a Palestinian American because her constituents in Georgia 
are, are, are mostly folks who are going to support uh, Vice President Harris. And even that was rejected. So I think we've been showing that our, one, our demands and our requests are, are not, you know, um, they're not something that should be seen as like undoable. Um, we're not asking for anything out of this world. We're asking that you adopt a policy that protects our families and our loved ones. We're asking you respect international and American law. We're asking you to signal to your base that you are adaptable, that you can change, that you can shift. Um, and all of that has, has clearly been denied. Um, that is why the Uncommitted National Movement came out with our most recent statement um, with a non-endorsement of Vice President Harris that she did not move on a, a policy change to earn an endorsement. An endorsement as a very specific thing that we would mobilize our base, we would mobilize uh, and use the infrastructure that we use to earn, you know, um, 100, 000, over 100,000 voters in Michigan with 1.5 million voter contact calls and messages, um, that we couldn't do that. But also, we know the dangers of Donald Trump, and, and we, are, we are telling uncommitted voters and supporters of our movement to um, register a vote in November um, that blocks Trump, even though we cannot use our infrastructure to help support of a vote for um, Vice President Harris. Um, so yeah, I totally reject that any, any vote um, that isn't for Vice President Harris within our communities should be blamed, we, we should receive the blame. It should definitely be that Vice President Harris did not do what the majority of her constituency, her Democratic base has asked her to do um, and asked Democrats to do since February. Um, but I also want to point out something that I don't think we talk enough about um, is I think there's real fears um, for Vice President Kamala Harris and her campaign team um, and, and APAC and really what the pro-Israel, pro-genocide interest groups, what hold they have in our government and in our elections. We saw how two members of the squad were, were removed um, this year, Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush, two black con uh, members of Congress who support uh, uh, conditioning aid or conditioning weapons funding to Israel and ending the genocide. And so I think there's a calculation there that we don't talk about enough as Kamala Harris is a black woman what, running for president um, and the implications that APAC has in our elections. And, and I think we don't talk about that dynamic enough. Even though I, I still think, you know, as a Palestinian American, as a Muslim American, um, I want to see uh, Vice President Kamala Harris do something that isn't just nice, pretty words. I, I want her to actually move on a policy that says my family is going to be safe. In, in Palestine, mm -hmm. that is going to tell me that my my Lebanese American friends and neighbors um, that their families are going to be safe in Lebanon. Uh, briefly, Laila, there is this question from Mark uh, Harrison asking: Are there any discussions taking place between Arab Americans and Black uh, voters in your area? Um, we've been doing a number of you know I'm I'm also a community organizer um, with We the People uh, Michigan. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work um, through my org through the organization I work for on bridging the uh, black community in Detroit and the Arab American community in Dearborn. Um, and so some of the things that we are trying to do is around local issues, um, local issues um, to create solidarity. One of those is our utility company. Um, we're both affected by um, this very um, monopolized utility company that um, Southeast Michigan folks pay the highest in utility um, in the country, but we have the least reliable service. Um, and that affects across our communities. And so we, that is how we've opened this window to talk about what does our solidarity look like 
around Gaza. And so locally, yes, we, we've been having those conversations. I think that we have uh, years more of organizing to do um, in order to create trust, in order to create, create real unity and solidarity. But outside of uh, Michigan, the Uncommitted National Movement has built a coalition that includes black movement leaders and black civil rights leaders um, that you know, are, are in this coalition to say, we support an immediate and permanent uh, uh, ceasefire. We support uh, uh, conditioning weapons funding to Israel. Um, and we will include uh, we will include that work in the work that we're already doing. And I think the biggest fear for us, for Uncommitted, is that through a Trump presidency, that coalition work is going to be a lot harder. Because not only will we be trying to organize for Gaza and for a liberated Palestine, but all of our allies, including us, are going to be blocking all of the dangers that Trump, and it's not just Trump, it's not just a Trump presidency, it's his little posse around him. <laughs> it, is, it is how Republicans are going to be emboldened under a Trump presidency to, to really attack our civil liberties for all of our communities. And so not just among uh, uh, mm -hmm. civil rights leaders and black movement leaders, but progressive organizations, um, you know, reproductive rights, climate uh, justice leaders, this coalition that we built that is multi-generational and multicultural um, and includes um, you know, major union and labor, including the largest labor in the country, the UAW. When we were in Chicago for the DNC, we met with eight labor um, unions um, to talk about how we can work together to include uh, ceasefire work, arms, and, uh, arms <clears throat> embargo work, um, and messaging in all that we do. All of that is under attack to continue under a Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much about what happens on November 5th, it's really what, what can we do after November 6th and what the fertile political landscape could look like. Voting is not just one day. Uh, it has implications. Uh, to, to, can can to I vote. just say something? Yes, please. You know, I, I don't think that uh, a, a Trump presidency is that really, really bad thing for America, to be honest with you, because you know what? It might give a, give a sense of purpose, a sense of mission to the Democrats. Democrats cannot unify except if there's Donald Trump. You know, under, under Donald Trump, I understand he went after minorities, but he also went after Democrats, he went after the media, he went after the deep state, he went after the army. So he formed that intersectional broad movement that stood up to him. Now we're dealing with Democrats who continue to promise, over-promise, and under-deliver. Let us go back to 2009. Democrats under the uh, Obama had a super majority in the Senate, had a majority in the House. You had the president in the White House who promised, uh, you know, stricter gun laws. They lost their super majority. They lost their majority in 2011, and they never passed these laws. He over-promised with the Obamacare, and we know what we ended up with. In 2009, when he met with uh, Jewish or uh, major Jewish organizations, he talked about the need to have a, um, a daylight between the United States and Israel. It ended that there was no daylight between the United States and Israel. So when it comes to the Democratic Party, I think history teaches us or experience teaches us that we don't get much of them because they take all of their constituent for granted. They continue to instill fear about the other candidate, about the other party, but they don't deliver. And the, the, last, the, the last thing I, I, I want to say here. In 2000, under Trump, I myself have been targeted by the government since 2006. I never found any support from a wider, uh, uh, a wider movement in America. But in 2017, suddenly I became the darling of that movement because they needed addresses to show Trump's suppression. So they were looking for these addresses. I think now it's not that we want Donald Trump to win, 
But again, it is on Kamala Harris. It's not that we are going to be necessarily the deciding uh, decisive factor here. But if he wins, we have to be prepared because he poses an American problem, a threat to America, not only to one community. And America has to own it because they have allowed this to happen. Okay, quick question regarding polling uh, addressed to uh, Dahlia and, and, and Jim. How do these polls that you guys do affect the campaigns? Can they really make a difference to the candidates, in your opinion? Dahlia and Jim, go ahead. I mean, we, I can't say how much the candidates care about the polling, um, but I can say that, you know, two campaigns, not Trump, but two other campaigns have reached out and, I, and have been briefed on our polling. So I think there's varying degrees of interest in, in what polls say. Um, I did want to just mention one thing that I think is important. We did another poll just on the support for a ceasefire in January where we polled American Muslims, American Jews, and the general public nationally. And what we found is that the majority of Democrats support a permanent ceasefire, and that includes the majority of Jewish Democrats. Jim? Yeah, they do reach out, they do call, they want to know what the numbers are. Does it make an impact, or does it help them shape the sense of what the contours of where the, the, the voters are? I think it does the latter more than anything. Um, there, you know, we operate oftentimes on anecdote. You know, the five guys I had coffee with last night, they're all voting this way. That's not helpful. It's better to have, that's why I don't like SMS polls, that's why I don't like you know, sending an email to your members and then coming back with 47% are supporting Jill Stein. Uh, that's your members are, are doing that. The more, I mean, the more rational thing to do is regardless of the outcome, do what we do, which is a scientifically based poll. You get results you don't always like, right? But at the same time, it tells you what people are really thinking. So yeah, it does make a difference and it helps us. It also helps, I think, the, the, the campaigns and it gives them a clearer sense of what the, the battlefield is. Look, just wanna say one thing. It, anybody tells me it doesn't matter, go talk to Springfield, Ohio fathers, their kids in school. Go talk to people who've been victims of this before and know what kind of hatred is out there. Talk to Maya Berry. Uh, who just finished uh, mm. testifying on, on, on Capitol Hill and got just the most brutal treatment imaginable, incitement, incitement to violence that sure enough was followed with death threats. It makes a difference. And as, as, as Layla noted, these are our allies. This is where they all are. This is our coalition. They may make the wrong choice, but we can't make the wrong choice because we have allies who depend on us. And I'm thinking of those fathers in Springfield, Ohio. Makes a difference, man. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate your uh, frank and substantive answers and discussions, uh, all four of you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a 10 minute or 12 minute left for a coffee break. Feel free to grab a cup of coffee outside and uh, come back for the next panel at 11.30 exactly. Thank you. Thank you.